It's great to be back, and I hope you're also very excited, particularly for our next speaker, because the organizers of the conference couldn't have chosen a more appropriate speaker to get us back on track. Caroline Glick, my dear and esteemed colleague and friend, is the senior contributing editor at the Jerusalem Post, and without a question, our most popular columnist. The recipient of numerous awards, Caroline does something many writers struggle with, the ability to take complex issues, tough issues, and translate into terms that get her points and messages across very clearly. And I have no doubt that we will experience the same here today. So please welcome Caroline B. Glick. Hi, thank you all so much for coming. It's good to be here again at the Jerusalem Post Conference for the second year now. Um, and I've decided, I was trying to figure out what to talk about, and I decided not to talk about Iran, because I don't think there's anything more to say except bombs away, so. <laughs> and they told me I have to talk for a half an hour. So I wanted to talk about something else, and we're talking about the Palestinians, and I'm just finishing a book about them uh, now, in case you notice, I haven't been around much. Uh, I was just finishing a book, or writing a book, and now I'm finishing it, so uh, we can talk about that this afternoon. And I decided that I wanted to take a step back and think about something else a little bit closer to home, and that is what's happening here in uh, the American Jewish community. Um, I don't know if you guys have been aware, but in recent weeks, you have had uh, divestment from Israel resolutions passing like the plague through the student senates in uh, various campuses of the University of California, in San Diego, in Berkeley, I think in Irvine. They're all passing resolutions to divest from Israel. And uh, US, uh, Sandy, UC San Diego, they passed the resolution to divest from Israel in their student senate, uh, about, I think three weeks ago. And um, when the Jewish students on campus were trying to figure out how to respond, uh, the people in Hillel told them not to oppose this resolution on its merits, but rather to just talk about how it makes them feel bad. That the Jews on the campus in the University of San Diego, University of California, San Diego, were told, we don't want to argue with this resolution that says Israel is an apartheid state and therefore doesn't have a right to exist, just like the UN General Assembly said in 1975 in that infamous resolution 3379 that called Zionism, the Jewish National Liberation Movement, a form of racism. And so today they said they're not anti-Israel, they're anti-Israeli apartheid. But of course, if you say that Israel is an illegitimate state, an immoral state that has no right to exist, that is inherently racist, what you're saying is that Israel has no right to exist and you wish it to be destroyed. That is what the BDS movement is about, destroying Israel. And for people not to be able to recognize this and not to be able to say, you people are appalling, and you should be ashamed of yourself, and how dare you? And I don't care about how it makes me feel. It should make you feel like idiots and like evil people, because that's what you are. It's not about me, and it's not about Israel. It is about you and your deranged, demented, and prejudiced perception of the Jewish people. But that's not what's happening. That is not what is happening. And by the way, as we saw when the resolution was passed in the University of California at San Diego Senate, that you're hurting my feelings as a Jewish person by saying mean things about Israel, strategy did not work. So it's ineffective and it's ridiculous. And this is not just on the left coast, it's also on the east coast. <clears throat> we just had a few weeks ago, we had the 92nd Street Y here inviting Roger Waters, 
to come and perform. Why? Roger Waters is one of the most outspoken haters of Israel in the music industry. He has been involved in convincing other musicians to cancel their scheduled appearances in Israel. He is at the forefront of the economic war that is being waged against Israel in left-wing circles throughout the Western world today. Why did the 92nd Street Y invite him? Because they like the other, the dark side of the moon? No, they invited him because he's one of the heads of the BDS movement. It made him controversial. He is having people blackball Israel and therefore he gets invited to the 92nd Street Y? Explain the logic to me, because I don't get it. And you know what? There was an outcry in New York among the Jewish community saying, why are you inviting this person? And he was disinvited. And he was disinvited not because, <laughs> believe you me, screaming works. The reason he was disinvited is obviously not because the people in the 92nd Street Y didn't want to hear what he had to say after they suddenly discovered that this man is an outspoken Jew hater. No, it's because they were embarrassed. And that begins to tell us the remedy to the current problem. And it's extremely important that we understand that. But first, give you a couple more examples we had here at YU. The Law Journal of Yeshiva University decided that they wanted to give an award for Middle East peace to the guy who wrote Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, or whatever it was called, former President Jimmy Carter. And speaking of Carter, and, and you know, it's not nice to, uh, maybe, maybe I shouldn't interject something, but something bothered me about, uh, well, m many of the things, but one of the things in particular that former uh, President, uh, former Prime Minister Ayod Olmert said during his remarks, which was that he said that uh, the, the, we can trust that the uh, Obama administration is serious about stopping Iran from acquiring the nuclear bomb because they wouldn't want as their legacy that uh, Iran acquired the bomb during their tenure in office, Hegel and Kerry and Obama. But I don't think that Jimmy Carter has a problem that during his tenure in office, Americans were taken hostage in the embassy and held for 444 days. That hasn't stopped him from opining ad nauseum about how he thinks that Israel is an apartheid state. I don't see him feeling embarrassed about his failures in office when he blames all the pathologies of the Arab world on the Jewish state. And yet this man was honored by YU, or their legal journal, for his peacemaking efforts. Now again, why would they honor Carter of all people? Because he wrote Palestine Peace, Not Apartheid. That's why they honored him. It's not despite that. This is how he defines himself and how he has defined himself for at least the last decade. So to pretend that you're doing something because of something that he did 30 years ago is simply to think that you know, we don't have the ability to think for ourselves. And I could go on and on, and example after example, the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival having, featuring my name is Rachel Corey, or the Jewish, the Jewish Community Center in Washington, D.C., producing the anti-Semitic diatribe, Seven Jewish Children, on and on and on and on. The question is, why is this happening? Why is it happening? I think that there are two possible explanations. And we have to consider them. One is that maybe the Jews who are doing this don't like Israel. Maybe they identify with the anti-Israel message of people like Waters and Carter and the BDS movement. Maybe. Maybe that's the problem. It's possible. We should find out, though, shouldn't we? Check that out. The other possibility is that they're dupes. They're ignorant. They're fools. Maybe they might be dupes, but say they are fools. Why are they being foolishly anti-Israel? Of all the things to be stupid about, why are they choosing to focus their foolishness on honoring people who seek the destruction of the Jewish state through delegitimization leading to isolation that's supposed to lead, as was the case with the apartheid regime in South Africa, to the collapse of the government and the regime. 
and the country. Why is this the focus of their foolishness? Why aren't they being foolish about Venezuela? Why aren't they being foolish about Cuba? Why aren't they being foolish about France? Why suddenly they're choosing Israel to be foolish about and ignorant about? I think that it's probably because of something that happened around about 1973 in the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War and has continued and become increasingly exacerbated in the intervening 40 years, which is that the left, the international left in the Western world, uh, abandoned Israel. You know, part of the American left's abandonment of Israel had to do with the European, the Western European abandonment of Israel following the OPEC uh, oil embargo uh, in the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War. And we all know how attractive it is to be like the French, so. <coughs> part of it is because uh, Russia broke off ties with Israel in 1967, although Truth be told, Russia had been pretty anti-Israel since 1950. Um, and, you know, if you want to be part of a movement, if you identify yourself with the left or with what the left is called in the United States with liberal politics, then you're put in an untenable position when you're called upon to decide whether uh, between your Zionism and your leftism. And the more anti-Israel the left-wing forces in American politics and social forces become, the more difficult it is for Jews who identify with the left to maintain their support for Israel. That's probably one of the reasons. And another one of the reasons is that it pays to be anti-Israel while being Jewish. Just ask Peter Beinart. The funny thing is that people like Beinart who sell out their own people and Israel and join the economic war to cause the delegitimization and the collapse of Israel, is that then they portray themselves as courageous. They actually have convinced themselves that they're being courageous by joining a massive, incredibly well-financed campaign to isolate with the aim of destroying the Jewish state. They think that's courageous. And they have a lot of people thinking that they're courageous too, and they're constantly saying, aren't I great, I'm such a hero, I'm so strong, because I'm willing to buck all of the major American Jewish organizations who aren't doing anything to criticize me. When I go out and say that we should boycott Israeli goods, we should divest our universities from holdings in the only liberal democracy in the Middle East and the United States' most important ally in the Middle East. And again, nobody's challenging them. Nobody is challenging them. In 2011, um, what's his name, the uh, playwright, was supposed to get a uh, honorary doctorate from CUNY. Huh? No, not Salman Rushdie. The, the... Yeah, Tony Kushner. Tony Kushner, the guy who wrote the revised uh, biography of Abraham Lincoln. Kushner. This is a man who's gone on record saying that it's a shame that Israel exists, right? And so Jeff. Weisenfeld, a terrific, terrific Jewish leader here in New York City, who is a trustee at City University of New York, objected. And he got the Board of Trustees to decide that the faculty decision to award this honorary degree to Kushner was wrong and to overturn their decision. But then the funniest thing happened. The faculty and the New York Times and all the A-listers in Hollywood stood behind Kushner. And they started a campaign to demonize Weisenfeld. And the president of CUNY said, oh, never mind, forget about what the trustees say. We're giving the award to Kushner. And then this whole movement started to get Weisenfeld thrown off the trustees of CUNY. And during this entire time, Jewish Federation of New York, JCRC, ADL, none of them said anything. 
none of them stood up to defend Weisenfeld against Kushner and the New York Times. Here is a man who took a stand and he was attacked and nobody defended him. Like, you know, we hear about all of these threats rising against Israel and they are enough to make your mind real. We have a lot of work that we have to do in Israel, but I'm very worried about what's happening here to the American Jewish community. We need each other, each other. And we have to be willing to face difficult situations head on and deal with them. And there's a lot of stuff going on in the United States today that makes you scratch your head when two jihadists who say they're acting in the name of jihad blow up the Boston Marathon and then everybody runs around saying, well, we're not nice enough to immigrants and that's why they did it. You know, they weren't nice to my great grandparents on the Lower East Side of New York. They probably weren't nice to your grandparents and great grandparents on the Lower Side of New York in the Bronx either. We didn't blow anybody up. Neither did the Koreans, neither did the Chinese who suffered here, neither did any of the Latinos or the blacks or anybody. Whether you're treated well or treated poorly as an immigrant group, nobody thought of blowing up the Boston Marathon in protest or in celebration. That only happened here with two self-proclaimed jihadists. And yet you see everybody from the White House down to the front page writers for the New York Times pretending that it's about America and not about them. And I think that a lot of this attempt to manipulate information or hide information or not stand up to difficult truths that's going on among the American Jewish community may be part of a much more general unwillingness that we're seeing in so much of the establishment in this country to simply call things by their names. But we have to push. We have to push because these things are important. I have to come to New York and tell you these things and not talk to you about Iran and not talk to you in some erudite way about North Korea and Syria because this is important. This is us. This is our business. We can fix it too. It's in the power of each and every one of us to do something about this. We can't do anything about Iran. That's for Benjamin Netanyahu to decide because he's going to measure up or not. But we have to measure up too. We have to measure up too. We have to say, no, 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 Mr. Beinart. No, 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 you Hillel directors in these colleges. We expect our Jewish youth on the campuses to stand up for themselves by standing up for Israel. We will help you. We will help you. If you're attacked, we will defend you. But we expect you to act too because it's about all of us and it's about our future, it's about our present, and it's about our past. You know, so I was, you know, I, I took off several months just now from writing in the Jerusalem Post because I am just finishing a book about uh, Israel and the Palestinians and, uh, and Judea and Samaria. And I was writing one of the chapters several weeks ago. It was about our national rights to Judea and Samaria. And I'm sitting in my office, which is in my basement, and it's this gorgeous day outside in Israel. I was going nuts. I said, well, I might as well just be writing this book in New York if I don't get out of this house. So I called up some friends of mine who live in Shiloh, and I said, you have 10 minutes till I got, get onto the highway and decide where I'm going today to tell me that you've arranged for a tour guide to take me around the tell. And if you don't, then I'm going to write about Marad Machpela in Hebron. <clears throat> so they came through. I felt like a real VIP when I got to the tell in Shiloh. There was guys standing at attention saying, I'm your tour guide, Glick. 
It's awesome. You should all go. Really amazing. I had been there before with my kids, but you have to see it. You go to Tel Shiloh, and you see what it means to be the indigenous people of the land of Israel. <laughs> Who this land belongs to. There was a Jewish town in Shiloh from the time of Joshua to the destruction, to the defeat of Bar Kokhba for 2,000 years. Continuous Jewish presence, Joshua, Samuel, Eli, Achia, and you look and you see the tabernacle. You look and you see where the jars were that had all the dried fruits for sacrifices, all perfectly preserved. You see our battles with the Philippines in 1050 BCE. Philistines, not Philippines, sorry. <laughs> and you see where our fighters under Bar Kokhba were hiding from the Roman legionnaires. We destroyed two Roman legions in that war. Nobody ever did that. And then as soon as we could, in 1978, just 11 years after the Six-Day War, we went back and we rebuilt it. It's extraordinary. That was a fulfillment of international law. That was the fulfillment of the promise of the international community to the Jews to reconstitute the Jewish commonwealth in the land of Israel. And you go to Israel today, and you see this country that is the fulfillment of the dreams of 2,000 years of exiled Jews. And it is awesome. It is awesome. It is inspiring beyond belief. And here, what do we see? Children going to high school and then going to college and not having any idea that this is the truth and not a competing narrative. This is a failure that isn't just a failure on the level of, oh, that's too bad. We are denying our children, the younger generation of American Jews coming of age today, of the greatest gift they have, which is their heritage, which is their history, which is their birthright. We have a lot of work in front of us, and we have to do it. We have to do it. You know, the Jerusalem Post, in many ways, is a bridge between the Jews of Israel and the Jews of the diaspora. And I know that I do my best from my little position as a columnist at the Jerusalem Post to bridge that gap. But all of us have to. And I tell you that the future of the Jewish people is Israel. And that the, Jerusalem, the Jews, Jewish people have a future. And it's extraordinary. We've never had this situation before, ever, in our history, ever ever. And we should all be celebrating it here in New York, in California, in Chicago, in Philadelphia, in France, in Buenos Aires. The Jewish people should be rejoicing today. We should be celebrating what we have. We shouldn't be throwing it away. We shouldn't be pretending that it's brave and courageous to betray our own people and the extraordinary efforts that we did unmatched in human history for an indigenous people to return and reconstitute their ancient homeland after 2,000 years, that's never happened before, and it will never happen again. We should be happy and proud and pleased that we are privileged to defend this today. And that's what we have to do. That is what we have to do. We see all of this nonsense with the BDS we see all of these honorees who are anti-Semites being honored by Jews. And we have to call this what this is, a humiliation, an embarrassment, and something that has to end. Thank you very much.